Hello everyone, this is group G21 and this is our presentation for the course project of CL246. We are basically building a food preserving chamber which uses the mechanism of hydrocooling to keep food content in it cold compared to the ambient temperature. This is our table of content that we'll be walking you through. Firstly, we'll be introducing our heat transfer problem, then giving you the industrial context of the problem, followed by a control volume and schematic diagram and features and layers of the solution. We will then present our problem as a technical textbook problem and present the heat transfer modes and their quantitative equations. This helps us to arrive at the numerical and analytical solution. We will be concluding by a simulation on open form that will give us the temperature profile and other variables. We will then correlate our results through validation by external sources and then provide the conclusion for the project. There are a lot of heat transfer problems around us. So how did we zero in on, on this one? Firstly, as hostel students, all of us felt that there was a need for a storage mechanism to keep fruits and other home cooked food with us for longer periods of time so that it doesn't get spoiled by heat and moisture and other things. As, a, as and when we progressed with this project, we realized that there are different groups of people who faced a similar problems, like travelers who are away from home for extended periods of time and agricultural workers who wish to keep their harvests for longer periods of time. So what did we decide to do with this problem? Let me give you an overview of the solution. So what did we do? We tried to build a cold storage enclosure that keeps food at lower temperatures compared to the ambient temperature. And, it's, and is lightweight, cost-effective, and environment-friendly. These three attributes are the main points in which we differ from its industrial counterpart. We believe it will benefit people living in hostels or living away from homes, as well as agricultural workers. The storage unit that we have thought of has dimensions of 75 cross 50 cross 30 centimeter cube. This is done so that it can lead uh, to optimization of space and it occupies minimum space. Wastage of food is not only a country level problem, but also a global problem. We hope that with this concept and other concepts like these, we can advocate healthy options for eating as well as less food wastage. We will be using chlorinated water as our coolant due to its suitable heat capacity, which absorbs maximum heat from the food item, as well as non-toxicity. The chlorine present in the water will be of minimum DPM, just enough to ensure that bacteria gets killed. A piping and sprinkler system is used to make the walls of the unit enclosure cool and foam is plastered across all faces of the cuboidal unit to minimize the heat flux from the environment. Let me give you some industrial context. Cold storage units in industry do exist, but they are bulky, expensive, and not customized as per individual taste. That is to say, they are not customized for individual types of food items. Hence, they are not fit for the general consumer. They also involve the use of extensive power supply and toxic coolants like Freon. We hope to counter these problems by not only using water, but also recycling it with the piping mechanism, thus leading to a cost-effective and environmental friendly solution. Just to illustrate the magnitude of the food wastage problem, we have a couple of statistics in front of us, which highlight the food wastage problem both in India and globally. This is the control volume that we'll be working on. So as you can see, there is heat flux that comes in from the environment to the box. And to model the food, we, we have kept a fruit item in the box. As you can see, that there's a thin water plate at the bottom of the box. This is uh, put forward with a sieve to ensure that the water that percolates towards the bottom layer gets collected here and then can get recycled by a piping mechanism. The water nozzles or the sprinkler system are at the top of the surface. There is a foam layer that insulates it from the environment across all six faces. The chamber itself is made of aluminum, for reasons for which we will see ahead. This is the schematic diagram of the chamber using G-Mesh. So the layers of the storage unit are as follows. Foam is the outermost layer and it's the insulator layer. Its conductivity is 0.026, which has been taken from empirical sources. It, is, it will be a, th a thick layer of 50 mm. Then we have the aluminum layer after the foam layer and its thickness will be 10 mm relatively low compared to the foam layer. The conductivity of aluminum is 15 watt per meter Kelvin. And so its contribution in overall resistance is negligible. Aluminum has the highest CP in the, in the industry at similar cost. Therefore, it ensures an efficient as well as cost effective procedure. And the third layer is the water layer that will be accumulated on the side walls after it is sprinkled from the nozzle. 
Following this, we have the resistance network, which highlights the three resistance that are in series. We have the convective resistance, resistance of the air, the conductive resistance of the foam, and the conductive resistance of the metal. Then we have the technical textbook problem. So consider a cold storage enclosure unit made of aluminum with polyurethane foam insulation layer with the given thermal conductivity and sprinkler system on the top surface edges. Inside the chamber, there is convective heat flow from the chlorine water. There is conduction inside the metal walls of the chamber with the given dimensions and units. Find the minimum required flow rate of chlorine water which is to be sprinkled so as to maintain a temperature of 5 degrees Celsius of the walls. Estimate the temperature of the top layer of the chamber, assuming heat transfer inside the chamber is only through conduction of air. This is the variables that we are hoping to find. So the heat transfer modes are as follows. There is conduction, convection and radiation. Radiation is assumed to be negligible or zero as we have outer wall temperature at air temperatures approximately equal. Inside the box, the temperature differences are so minute that radiation is neglected. So we have convection happening mainly from the inner surface of the chamber where water as a fluid will take away the heat coming from outer walls through convection. And the conduction will happen in through aluminum walls in the foam layer. We perform an integral balance to calculate the heat, convective heat transfer coefficient and thus the corresponding Reynolds number and flow velocity that we're interested in. So basically we equate the heat that is given by the environment to the heat that water would be taking from the surface. Then we, to calculate the mass flow rate, we assume that the flowing water reaches the temperature of the walls by the time it has reached the base. And that is the equation given for it. These are some assumptions that we have taken and the reasoning for them as well. So we have taken contact resistance between foam layer and metal wall zero. We have taken laminar flow and the corresponding Nusselt correlation for it. We have taken constant fluid properties with respect to uh, changing pressure and gravity effects, neglecting viscous dissipation. All air properties are taken constant at a constant temperature. These are the governing equations that we have used. So we have equated the two heat fluxes, one uh, that the air gives through the, to the surface and the one in which water takes away the heat from the surface. And that is the first relation. Then we have taken the Nusselt correlation from the textbook for the laminar external flow of liquid. Then we have taken the heat absorbed by water to be MCP delta T. And we have taken convective heat transfer equation. This is the solution algorithm that we have followed. First, we have constructed a thermal resistance model. We have collected all flow properties and decided the wall temperature. Then we have performed an integral balance in which we have calculated the required flow velocity and the associated Reynolds number, followed by an integral balance again, in which we have calculated the mass flow rate of the chilled water required. We have also done an open form and dimensionless analysis treating the 3D model as a 2D rectangular box model. And then we have done iterative procedures to estimate the temperature of the top surface as well as the fluid temperature. This is the numerical part of the calculation in which we are finding the flow velocity. So after equating the heat fluxes, we find a value for H and then we find the Nusselt number from this correlation. Then we find the Reynolds number and once we have the Reynolds number, we can get the velocity by plugging in the formulas. We then move on to find the flow rate and the film thickness by using MCP delta T is equal to the heat flux, following which film thickness is obtained by dividing the mass flow rate by the density. Now this is about the use of open foam. We are basically using open foam to find the temperature profile in the chamber. We know the boundary conditions of our chamber. We have kept temperature of five sides as a constant temperature and there is a constant heat flux coming in from the top surface. We have simplified our 3D model as a 2D model since we were able to solve it on open form easily. We have then practiced an iterative procedure to find the top surface temperature. With the given boundary conditions, we have guessed the top surface temperature, found out the flux through it, and then obtained another value of temperature corresponding to the flux. We have kept on doing this until our guessed value and actual value have converged. This was the dimensionless analysis done in which the temp dimensionless temperature, dimensionless X coordinate and dimensionless Y coordinate were written as follows. This is the table of iteration and convergence of the T assumed and the T obtained. We stopped once we got close convergence up to two decimal points. We've, took, we've taken the final top surface temperature as 9.93 degrees Celsius. After this, we found the estimate temperature of the fluid kept inside, which is what our goal was. We found it to be six to seven degrees Celsius. We then validated it with 
empirical correlations obtained from the internet. And we found out that we were very close to the ideal storage temperatures for a large variety of foods. After validating our results, we then moved on to find the temperature profile of this. This is the 1D numerical uh, analytical temperature profile that we had obtained in the start of the project. You can see that it follows convection from air, followed by conduction through the foam, followed by conduction through the metal wall, and conduction to the air inside the chamber. You can observe that the conduction uh, part of the temperature profile is a linear slope, whereas the convection part is not. The conduction part through metal wall is a steeper slope than conduction through the foam. This is the temperature profile obtained by open foam. It is parabolic in nature. It was obtained by open foam and viewed by parabolic. So we can now come on the conclusion of the project. We were able to find a satisfactory flow rate for the steady state temperature of five degrees Celsius. This tells us that we don't need the water sprinkler system to operate directly on the fruit. That is to sprinkle water directly on the fruit and that sprinkling the water on the side walls is sufficient to maintain the fruit at the required temperature of six to seven degrees Celsius. This comes as a relief since water kept on fruits for a long time would have led to chemical oxidation, thereby spoiling them. We have already validated our results with empirical data and therefore we know we are going in the correct direction. The temperature required to maintain this fruit at six to seven degrees Celsius can be easily used, uh, can be easily uh, obtained with the help of cold water. Therefore, no external power supply is needed. This is energy efficient as well as environmental friendly. To present decisive data, we decided to focus on fruits and get the uh, get data validated for fruits itself. But this could be done for various food categories, and thus we could be we could help other people as well. We could have made further modification in terms of boundary conditions. We could have taken heat flux at the top surface of the enclosure and other faces at a constant temperature at the boundary conditions. However, a different set of boundary conditions would have given us a different solution. The nusselt tumbler correlation that we took was for laminar external flow. But if we had taken one for turbulent external flow, it would have given us a different solution, which could perhaps be closer to the real, real situation. With the assumptions that we have taken and perhaps some more ideation on the piping and sprinkler mechanism, we believe such a solution can be incorporated and used for people's benefit. Thank you for, the, for viewing our presentation and we hope you enjoyed it.